not easy being a superhero. It's physically exhausting, mentally draining, and you're on call 24-7. Superheroes aren't always as they appear. Their real stories are filled with drama and many surprises. Comic Book Superheroes Unmasked, next on The History Channel. I'm Peter Wilson from the new film, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. The History Channel asked me to talk to you about comic book superheroes. Most things about superheroes aren't the way they appear at first glance. To some, this is merely kid stuff. But take a look behind the mask and you'll find something deeper going on. Superheroes have been dealing with serious personal, social and political issues ever since the Great Depression. The real story behind superheroes is filled with as much drama, and as many surprises as anything you'll find in the pages of a comic book. In 1938, the first and greatest superhero of them all, Superman, leaped from the pages of Action Comics number one into the imaginations of children everywhere. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Today, Superman has become a national icon, and that 10-cent comic could sell for over $300,000. But The Man of Steel nearly didn't get published. At first, only two people believed in him, his creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. In 1931, there were two 17-year-old kids from Cleveland, Ohio, who were obsessed with science fiction. Jerry Siegel wrote the stories and his pal Joe Schuster illustrated them. The creations were never sold. Yet these poor Jewish kids dreamed that their sci-fi fantasies would someday bring them fame and fortune. In the 1930s, the big new trend in newspapers was the adventure comic strip. There was quality in the writing, there was quality in the drawing, there was just a general air of capital Q quality associated with newspaper comics. That's what Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster wanted for themselves. Siegel and Schuster's hero combined elements of everything they'd read, from comic strips to pulp magazines. He would be the last survivor of a dead planet, rocketed to Earth like a science fiction Moses, with the strength of Hercules fighting for the common man, Superman. Many years later, Jerry Siegel wrote about his inspiration. He recalled, I had crushes on girls who didn't care I existed. So it occurred to me, what if I was really terrific? Jumping over buildings or throwing cars around. Superman was sent to every newspaper syndicate in the country. They all said no. I wrote back to them and told them this very patronizing letter that they weren't ready for prime time, that they should stay in Cleveland for another year until they developed their art style, because the art was quite crude. So much for my great editorial judgment. Newspapers were saying no, but another newer medium held out some promise, comic books. Selling on newsstands for a dime, comic books were originally just reprints of newspaper strips. It was the cheapest way for newspaper publishers to put, repackage their comic strips. It was the video tape of its day. Then in 1935, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, a pulp magazine writer turned comic publisher, had a revolutionary idea. Comic books with all new, never before published material. But to make his idea work, the material had to come cheap. The only people they could get to produce this content were guys that couldn't get work doing anything else because they were too young, or they were too inexperienced, or they were Jewish. Siegel and Schuster fit the bill. Wheeler Nicholson's company, soon to be called DC, gave the pair steady work. In 1938, the company, under new ownership, took a chance with the strip everyone had rejected. Siegel and Schuster, both 23, finally saw Superman published in the first issue of DC's Action Comics. Schuster cut up the panels, rearranged them in comic page form, and the golden age of comics began with the first issue of Action Comics. 
Imagine how amazing it would be to open up that first issue. I'll never have anything approaching the level of a sense of wonder that those first uh, kids that opened up action number one had way back in the day. The first stories were crude but direct. Unlike most newspaper heroes, Superman lived in the same world as his readers. This wasn't medieval England or another planet. This was a city, a metropolis of lynch mobs and wife beaters, where politicians were crooks, where businessmen exploited workers and started wars in South America. It was the real world of 1938, a world in need of a hero. He was the spirit of the people. He was up against corrupt landlords and, 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 and vile dictators and, and, and bad generals and all that. The New Deal, of course, was an effort to try to redirect people to look to a powerful force, the federal government, to serve as their benefactor, uh, their protector against you know, local and greedy, corrupt interests. Comic book superheroes were super new dealers, <laughs> like costume versions of Franklin Roosevelt. But what really made Superman revolutionary was his alter ego, Clark Kent. Kent made Superman accessible. And in turn, he needed to be Kent to be human, to have access to us. Superman comes from this other place to America. He can never go back there. It's been destroyed, very much as the Europe that, that especially the European Jews uh, left behind, was eventually destroyed. He is adopted by this ultimate American couple. He leaves behind the vaguely Hebraic sounding Cal L and becomes Clark Kent, the ultimate American. Even if you don't look at him as an allegory of the immigrant, he is an immigrant. He did come to America and he did make good. Superman's secret identity was an especially potent fantasy for the primary readers of comic books, boys. They were powerless like Clark Kent, but they dreamed that inside they were invincible heroes. Soon, it seemed like the whole country was caught up in the fantasy. There was a Superman radio show, along with motion picture cartoons, toys, and advertisements. His popularity in comic books even convinced a newspaper chain to turn him into a daily strip read by 20 million people. Meanwhile, each monthly issue of Action Comics with Superman sold nearly a million copies. Naturally, DC wanted another costumed character to match Superman's success. Bob Kane, a 22-year-old journeyman cartoonist, took up the challenge, along with 25-year-old writer Bill Finger. The Batman debuted in the 27th issue of Detective Comics. Unlike Superman, he had no superpowers, and there were other differences. While Superman fought for a liberal social agenda, the Batman fought crime, plain and simple. His story began when millionaire playboy Bruce Wayne, as a boy, witnessed the kind of street violence Depression-era readers knew all too well. He saw his parents killed, and now he's obsessed with uh, symbolically avenging those murders. It's perfect, and there's no way to elaborate. You say that, and you understand the character. Batman is a fascinating character, because he's so driven. Not the dude puts on, you know, the outfit with funny ears and the cape and he goes beats the crap out of criminals. It's his thought process that's behind it. Having the willpower to change his whole life and to balance being a spirit of vengeance and a spirit of justice, I think that's an immediately appealing concept. In the early stories, Batman was described as a weird figure of the dark, an avenger of evil, just as scary as any mobster, monster, or mad doctor. Readers loved him. DC now had two incredibly popular superheroes who were about to have a whole lot of company. Within a few years, there were dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of costumed superheroes uh, with all kinds of varying powers. Comic book superheroes unmasked, brought to you in part by DirecTV and by Terminix. Dear DirecTV, there's not a word to describe how great DirecTV is. It's not great. It's not greater than great. It's even greater than greatest. My mom, I first didn't know if it was a good idea, but now she loves DirecTV, and it saves her money. Sign, Brian Mills. Brian, I think I'm gonna have you write my next review. <laughs> Become a DirecTV fan for just $39.99 a month. Hi! Come on in! Kind of breezy in here! With 80 mile per hour winds! It's in 
spider can't grab hold of a scarface. What? No, God! Meet my husband, Stanley! What? Stanley! Here's a better idea. Call Terminix. More people trust us to solve their pest problems. 1-800-TERMINIX. No bugs, no hassles. All I want is a room somewhere. A comfy space I don't have to share. A workout. A pool. Breakfast complimentary. Yeah. And a welcome, Mr. Watson. Good to see you. And how about a fresh cup of joe? At Hampton Inn, you got it, people. From folks who'll do everything to make you feel completely loverly, utterly satisfied. We love having you here. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely? Have you heard about the neighborhood? Where you can get local and long distance together for one low monthly price. Where your calling is unlimited around town and across the country where voicemail and caller id are included at no extra charge the neighborhood built by mci where you can talk as long as you want as often as you want for one low monthly price call 1-800-JOIN-MCI today and get unlimited local and long distance together you know every so often package like this is delivered right to my door i like to think of it as my lifeline you know i have diabetes these are my testing supplies. I check my blood sugar and I check it often. Liberty Medical makes sure I have everything I need when I need it. Now you may not know this, but if you're on Medicare, the cost of your diabetes testing supplies may be covered, whether you use insulin or not. Liberty makes it easy. They bill Medicare and your insurance company, so you have no paperwork. You pay nothing up front, your supplies are delivered right to your door, no charge for shipping. So check your blood sugar as often as you should. And call Liberty. They can help you live a better life. For more information, call Liberty Medical at 1-888-634-9525. That's 1-888-634-9525. Call today. It was a bastion of torture and slow death that has been called the most terrifying prison in the world, Devil's Island on Hardcore History, tonight at 11 on the History Channel. With two very different superheroes raking in profits at the newsstands, it wasn't long before other publishers got into the comic book business. They knew what readers wanted, crime fighters with catchy names, and most importantly, costumes. That was a lesson cartoonist Will Eisner learned when he was developing a detective hero. One night, he got a phone call from his publisher, Busy Arnold. Working the, the, on the drawing board, and the phone rings, and I could hear the jukebox going on. He was in a bar. He said, have you got a character yet? I said, yeah, I've got this guy, a detective. He said, yeah, but does he have a costume? So I'm sitting there, I was drawing the face, and I drew a mask on him. I said, well, he's got a mask. He says, that's good, that's good. What else? I said, well, he wears gloves. Oh, he says, go with that. He says, that's good. <laughs> so anyway, that was how the spirit uh, got a costume. By 1940, costumed superheroes were flooding the newsstands. At DC, Superman and Batman were joined by The Flash, Hawkman, Green Lantern, and more. Rival companies offered Catman, Bulletman, and scores of others. DC was the biggest comic book publisher but there were more than a dozen competitors. One was Timely Comics, which would one day be known as Marvel. DC Comics were certainly better drawn and better written, but the Timely books uh, seemed to embrace more mavericks and wilder ideas. Case in point, Bill Everett, the creator of Timely's antisocial amphibian, The Submariner, and Carl Burgos, creator of crime-fighting android The Human Torch, wanted to have their characters meet in a gigantic slugfest. Fire and water, the battle of the century. Timeless publisher Martin Goodman heard their idea on the Thursday and told Burgos and Everett to have it on his desk by Monday. So Bill and Carl called up everyone that they knew who was involved in comics for a kind of jam session. Pages were being drawn uh, before they were written. One guy who turned the bathroom into his office put a board across his legs and wrote in the bathtub. People who were yelling out their ideas 
arguing about which would be the best way to get the job done. The neighbors went crazy, called the cops. The phone was ringing off the hook, but by Monday morning, those dozen guys had completed a 60-page book. The first generation of comic book creators were incredibly hardworking men. They had all grown up in lower working class environments, practically without exception. The Great Depression had an awful lot to do with the fertility of comics in all of those years. These guys were willing to work incredibly hard to make the stuff real. One of the hard working guys at Timely was a distant relative of the publisher named Stanley Martin Lieber. Lieber would later be known by his pen name, Stan Lee, often called the father of modern comics. Lee started at Timely in 1939 as a teenaged assistant. Even then, Lee thought comic book superheroes should appeal to an older audience. Publisher Martin Goodman thought that was crazy. I used to argue with him because I wanted to write things that were a little more adult for more intelligent readers. And he used to say to me, Stan, we have nobody but very young kids reading our books and a few illiterate adults. Lee's boss wasn't alone in his opinion. Although newspaper strips were read by everybody, comic book publishers knew that their magazines were read almost exclusively by children. Kids began reading comics as soon as they could read. It was the first purchase you made yourself, except for maybe a pack of gum or penny candy. So instead of getting more mature, superheroes began changing to better reflect the juvenile market. To make Batman more appealing to kids, his creators transformed him from a weird avenger of evil into a father figure. They invented Dick Grayson, a young acrobat who, like Batman, sees his parents murdered. Batman takes the boy under his wing, and comics' first kid sidekick, Robin the Boy Wonder, is born. The theory was that young readers would identify with young heroes. And in fact, Batman's sales doubled after the introduction of Robin. Soon, there was an avalanche of sidekicks. The Human Torch and Toro, the Sandman and Sandy, Green Arrow and Speedy, Catman and Kitten, the Black Terror and Tim. This idea of kid sidekicks, I hated it. The court would go after the guy for imperiling the safety of a minor, if nothing else. While some readers did identify with the kid sidekicks, everybody identified with the superhero who was a kid in real life. Fawcett Publications' Captain Marvel. Created in 1940 by writer Bill Parker and artist C.C. Beck, Captain Marvel is actually a young boy named Billy Batson. When he says that one magic word, Shazam, he becomes this big, beefy, strapping superhero. That's kind of the ultimate wish fulfillment aspect of the superhero. And I don't think it was ever expressed more purely than in that form. Pure or not, Superman's publisher, DC Comics, felt that Captain Marvel's form, a black-haired, flying strong man with a cape, was a little too close to their man. They sued. DC just felt threatened by Fawcett because Captain Marvel, for a while, was outselling Superman. And they kept at that lawsuit. The legal battle lasted 12 years, until 1953, when Fawcett finally agreed to stop publishing Captain Marvel. Readers at the time weren't aware of the battle between Superman and Captain Marvel. To kids, there was room enough on the newsstands for both, and more. Superhero fantasies were a new way for readers to deal with the realities of the Depression. Now, an even bigger challenge would be just over the horizon. The superheroes would be going to war. We were fighting Hitler before our government was fighting Hitler. Check out what's coming up tomorrow night on Tech Tuesday, here on the History Channel. When you want a battery that keeps going, and going, and going, and going. Energizer Max. Do you have the bunny inside? Got the bunny inside. Introducing McCormick Grillmates Grilling Sauces. Just grill, brush, and let the feast begin. New Grillmates Grilling Sauces, along with seasonings and marinades, are from McCormick, the taste you trust.
When you can get the best of wireless without a contract, that's M Life. Go phone, only from AT&T Wireless. When a madman threatens the world, the greatest adventurer who ever lived must summon the most extraordinary heroes. And the game is on. Sean Connery. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. This film is not yet rated July 11. Behind them is a 19th century cabin with a 19th century roof. Ahead of them is a 21st century modern with a 21st century electrical system. But right now, life is perfect thanks to a clear sky, a smooth ride, and the electronic four-wheel drive 260 horsepower Acura MDX. From city to city, state to state, and coast to coast, Verizon Wireless is helping to bring families closer together with unlimited night and weekend minutes. It's all part of the America's Choice National Family Share Plan, giving your family unlimited night and weekend minutes to share on up to four separate lines so they can say whatever, whenever, wherever. And now, save big on select LG phones. Verizon Wireless, we never stop working for you. Come rain or shine. Can you hear me now? Good. Yeah, is the president there? Kelly Grant from Fort Wayne, Indiana? Sure, I'll hold. Yeah, hello. Yes, Mr. President. Say, I know you're busy, but could you take care of this Social Security solvency thing so no one has to worry about it? Sure, no problem. Great. Anything else you need? Nope, that'll do it. Bye. If one person could do it alone, the world wouldn't need an ARP. It was a bastion of torture and slow death that has been called the most terrifying prison in the world. Devil's Island on Hardcore History. Tonight at 11 on the History Channel. In 1939, the war in Europe had begun. Even though America wasn't involved yet, many superheroes were. By the end of the year, the Submariner began turning his general hatred of humanity against the Nazis in particular. We just could all see what a menace Hitler was. It was more than what he was doing to the Jews. It was what he was doing to the whole world. He was gobbling up countries. Superman's creators Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster thought the Man of Steel could stop the war in two pages. In a special story for Look magazine in February 1940, Superman simply grabs Hitler and his then ally Stalin and drops them off at the League of Nations. End of story, end of war. In American society, we believe in instant solutions. Superheroes do that. Superman's paper victory made its way to Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, who reportedly called Superman a Jew. The official SS newspaper mocked Siegel as physically and intellectually circumcised. Well before the U.S. entered the war, superheroes weren't just waving the flag, they were wearing it. Timely Comics had the greatest anti-Nazi of them all, who burst on the scene with an unforgettable cover. Captain America threw a smashing right cross to the jaw of Adolf Hitler. That said everything about the character. They got hate mail for that. Uh, they got hate mail from isolationists. But most superhero fans didn't care. Captain America exploded on the newsstand and sold out of his first issue. The story begins as war is looming. FDR approves a secret project to create an army of super soldiers. Frail Steve Rogers is the first volunteer. The brilliant Professor Reinstein injects him with a strange liquid. In seconds, Rogers is a perfect physical specimen, dubbed Captain America. When a Nazi spy kills the professor, the secret of the formula dies with him. So Captain America carries on alone, except for army mascot turned kid sidekick, Bucky Barnes. Captain America was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, who guided him through his first 10 issues. Joe was a writer. Jack was always at that board, mumbling to himself, smoking a cigar and drawing. Jack Kirby, 
born Jacob Kurtzberg, would become one of the legends of the industry. He was the Shakespeare or Cervantes or take your pick of comic books. He introduced a whole new level of motion into comic books, and that was revolutionary for the time. The page couldn't contain the degree of action. Simon and Kirby occasionally mixed action with political prophecy. In the spring of 1941, Cap and Bucky stop an unnamed Asian power from destroying the U.S. Pacific Fleet, seven months before Pearl Harbor was attacked. When the Japanese actually did cripple that same fleet, Captain America's wrath echoed the nations. With war declared, the Menentites cast all restraint to the winds. The superheroes went off to war with great gusto. Week after week, month after month, just pounding the hell out of the Nazis. The stories had so much pro-American propaganda that you'd almost think they were subsidized by the government, but it was just, we felt we had to do that. And then something very interesting happened, which was that comic books were included in care packages that were sent to soldiers, along with chocolate and cigarettes, and comic books became part of the standard reading material for GIs serving in the Second World War, and they liked them. The superheroes were now in sync with the government's war effort and comic book sales soared from 15 million a month in 1942 to 25 million a month a year later. World War II was the peak of what would be called the golden age of comics. And why not? In the comic books, the Americans always won. The war in the comic books looked like something that was kind of fun. And the, the striking contrast between that and the war itself must have bothered some people. The superheroes fought two kinds of Japanese, buck-toothed and fanged. But while the Japanese and Nazis were both portrayed as sadistic monsters, the Nazis' ultimate horror was never mentioned. Certainly it was an opportunity to talk about the Holocaust, which everybody knew was beginning to happen. But nobody in comics would attempt it because I think, essentially, you felt that your audience wouldn't be interested in that. They wouldn't, they wouldn't understand it. There was a sort of uh, irony in the fact that these characters, many of whom in that period in the Golden Age had been evolved to fight the Nazis, uh, were themselves very much in the Nazi ideal. And the idea that you can solve problems through physical strength, by like being stronger and more dominating, more powerful, that is fascism. I mean, that's it. That's the essence of fascism. And I don't think the creators of, of superheroes or the kids who were reading at the time were the slightest bit aware of it. To one character, fascism was just another example of male aggression. But then, everything about Wonder Woman was different. Wonder Woman was a particularly interesting character created by uh, a psychologist. Charles Moulton was really Dr. William Moulton Marston, an author, one of the inventors of the lie detector, and an early defender of comics. The Harvard-educated Marston was hired by DC as a consultant. The honcho hired him to think of a way to do a female Superman. Why not go after the girl audience? And Marston apparently decided to do it himself. He came in probably as the first established writer to move into doing comics. Marston began the saga in 1941 as a wounded intelligence officer, Steve Trevor, crash lands on the island home of the immortal Amazons. The Queen's daughter, Princess Diana, falls in love with the helpless man. Her love makes her realize that the Amazons face the same decision other isolationists and pacifists face in 1941. Try to ignore the Nazis or fight for freedom. Against her mother's protests, Diana goes back with Steve to defend America, described by the goddess Athena as the last citadel of democracy and equal rights for women. Like Superman, Wonder Woman was more powerful than a locomotive, and she had better gadgets than Batman. An invisible plane, a telepathic tiara, a magic lasso that forced people to obey her, and bulletproof bracelets. Wonder Woman was a great success. The female aspect was very heavily uh, played. The artist, H.G. Peter, however, had a very masculine approach. Artistically, it appealed to male readers. Something else might have appealed to male readers. 
Wonder Woman lost her power and free will if men bound her bracelets together. There was definitely an S&M quality about the appeal of Wonder Woman. Almost every book was riddled with female domination, bondage, subjugation, punishment, and uh, loads of fetishes. Back then, I guess nobody got it. Certainly, no readers at the time knew of Marston's unconventional home life. He lived happily with his wife and their children, and a former student who always wore metal bracelets on both wrists, and their children. Despite his avant-garde lifestyle, Marston had Wonder Woman give down-to-earth advice for kids on the home front, urging them to collect old paper and scrap metal, which could be recycled into war material for soldiers overseas. Other patriotic heroes also promoted collecting scrap or buying war bonds, and some even made financial sacrifices to do so. Captain America requested kids not to send a dime for the membership card and the tin badge, but to spend the dime for war bonds. You know, every dime you spend may be the dime that uh, puts a bullet in the last chap in the war. Here, Captain America's sidekick urges kids to collect scrap paper for the war effort. Little did he realize that request would turn comic books from 10 cent trash into eventual treasure. World War II created the collector's market to some extent because when they were looking for paper, the first thing that mom wanted to throw out was those damn comic books. And so when you go and find a Golden Age book that's selling for $6,000, you can thank World War II for that. At the time, none of the young artists or writers dreamed that their work would one day be so valuable. They were too busy cranking out stories or leaving the business altogether to go to war. I felt I can't be writing about all these comic book heroes and not be fighting myself. When the artists and writers went off to war, the publishers had to give the strips to different artists and different writers and the publishers began to feel that they were in charge of these characters. The characters became corporate characters, controlled more by the corporation. The readers also seemed to want a little calm and stability after 16 years of depression and war. So the heroes began losing their edge. By 1945, Batman was an establishment figure. He carried a platinum badge. Superman went through a change as a sort of outside loner into the ultimate lawful authority. Ironically, just as superheroes got blander, post-war politicians attacked them as threats to the very foundation of the country. In the 1950s, comic book superheroes would face their greatest battle, not against a mad scientist or a foreign army, but against the United States Senate. Check out what's coming up tomorrow night on Tech Tuesday, here on the History Channel. You taking that for heartburn? Panel of experts recommend it. More doctors recommend Tums. Dose for dose, Tums Ultra neutralizes more acid than Pepsi completes antacid. Nothing's faster. Just ask a real panel of experts. Behind them is a snippy maitre d' and a wilted Caesar. In front of them is a family drama playing itself out. But right now, life is perfect. Thanks to a full moon, a powerful engine, and the Audubon-tested suspension of the Acura RL. When a madman threatens the world, the greatest adventurer who ever lived must summon the most extraordinary heroes. And the game is on. Sean Connery. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. This film is not yet rated July 11th. 
Now, if you'll walk to your left, Fred will give you some goggles. Okay. <laughs> What's with all the lights? Keeps the roaches out. They hate the lights. Yeah, we keep them out 24 7. Jeez. Jeez. Here's a better idea. Call Terminix. More people trust us to solve their pest problems. 1 800 Terminix. No bugs, no hassles. <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time. My small business is always busy. My family never slows down. I don't have time for complicated phone plans. I just want things simple. So we got MCI business complete. I got the neighborhood built by MCI. Now I get unlimited local calls. And unlimited long distance. Together. Together. For one low price. On one bill. How, How simple is that? At home or at your small business, get unlimited local and long distance for one low monthly price. Call 1-800-JOIN-MCI today. I like to have fun when I'm online, but my old email just wasn't any fun. Then I signed up for MSN 8, got my butterfly. This guy never quits. Now I can email photos with graphics and cool type. Now that's fun. He also lets me browse with my friends. Well, you know, surf the same sites at the same time. It's great. Yep, me and my butterfly, or what you call social creatures. Looking for a more expressive internet service? Try MSN 8, built with advanced Microsoft software. Go to get.msn.com today and get two free months when you sign up. MSN 8 helps you take email farther with photo editing and custom graphics built right in. You'll also get shared browsing that lets you link up with a friend and see the best of the web together. Plus other features AOL can't match. Switching is easy and hassle-free with powerful switching software that moves your AOL address book, notifies your contacts, and forwards your emails for a month. Go to get.msn.com today and get two free months when you sign up. MSN 8. It's better with the butterfly. It was a bastion of torture and slow death that has been called the most terrifying prison in the world. Devil's Island on Hardcore History. Tonight at 11 on the History Channel. Comic books reached their greatest popularity in the early 50s. The paper rationing of the war years was no longer mandated. Nevertheless, Average monthly sales climbed from 25 million in 1943 to almost 100 million in 1953. But if the industry was doing well, superheroes weren't. Readers were now more interested in other genres, funny animals, teen comedies, westerns, gangsters, and horror stories. Superheroes were so closely tied in with, first of all, the culture of the New Deal and then uh, the World War II culture that they had trouble surviving. When the war was over, the, the enemy was beaten. We didn't need superheroes anymore. Not only had the GIs changed their tastes and grown more sophisticated, but the guys who were making the comics were tired of the same slugfest. The luster died, and the superhero died with it. There were only three that endured, and that was Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. DC had faith in Wonder Woman's potential as a licensed property. Batman had already starred in two successful Saturday morning movie serials and guest starred on Superman's radio show. Superman, the first superhero, expanded his audience with tales of his youth in Smallville. Superman was a national symbol. In the early 40s, Superman's mission was defined one way. Superman fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. By the 1950s and the, uh, the introduction of the Superman television show, of course, it became truth. Justice and the American Way. That phrase, the American Way, was all over the place in the 1950s because now we're stuck in a Cold War. But as Superman entered the 1950s, more popular than ever, his creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, were out of the business. A few years earlier, they had sued DC in an attempt to reclaim the rights to Superman and to get millions in royalties they said the company owed them. In 1948, they lost their suit and in D.C. let them go. Jerry Siegel was essentially fired from the strip that he had created. At least Siegel and Schuster were out of the line of fire when the comic book business came under attack. A psychiatrist named Frederick Wortham suddenly got on a soapbox and began preaching against comic books. Born in Munich, Wortham had been the senior psychiatrist at New York's Bellevue Hospital as well as the director of a low-cost psychiatric clinic in Harlem. In the 1940s, he began conducting his own studies into abnormal behavior in young people. He went around from 
from uh, prison to prison interviewing juvenile prisoners. And one of the questions we asked him was, what do you read? Well, he discovered that all of them read comics. Ergo, comics are destroying our society. I think he had a genuine concern for kids, um, which got out of control. <laughs> Wortham's assault on comics began in early 1948, and the anti-comic mood spread around the world. Comic books were seen overseas as this virus of American culture and crime. Since they couldn't keep up with us militarily or economically anymore, they could at least try to fight against our culture. In his 1954 book, Seduction of the Innocent, Wortham even attacked the Man of Steel, coining the term the Superman Complex. Wortham defined the condition as fantasies of sadistic joy in seeing other people punished over and over again, while you yourself remain immune. Batman and Robin were like a wish dream of two homosexuals living together. Wonder Woman was the exact opposite of what girls are supposed to be. He had the title doctor in front of his name and um, people listened to him. He was a good huckster, got a lot of publicity and it almost destroyed the comic book business. And a lot of people were saying good riddance if that happened. In 1954, U.S. Senators Estes Kefauver and Robert Hendrickson held hearings on the effects of popular culture on young minds. They were kind of like a B-movie uh, precursor to the Army McCarthy hearings, which were occurring at right about the same time. And they were both about equally ridiculous. When the Senate committee's attention turned to the evils of comics, Dr. Wortham was the star witness, with testimony like, comic books are obscene glorifications of violence and crime. Today's children have been seduced by Superman. And Hitler was a beginner compared to the comic book industry. Every American saw us in this horrifically negative light. And then as an industry, we just bent over for the government. Fearing government censorship, most of the major comic book publishers created the Comics Code Authority, a self-censoring organization that would issue seals of approval. Everything that was published had to be sent first to this organization and they had to put the seal of approval on it indicating that the stories weren't too sexy, weren't too violent and would in no way upset any young or older reader. In their new code approved stories, Superman worked closer than ever with lawful authorities. Batman and Robin spent more time with girls and Wonder Woman hung out more with Steve. But superhero relationships stayed at the level of grade school crushes. That instilled that belief in the American public that comics are strictly a, a kid's medium. I mean, we're still fighting against that stigma today. The code also enforced rigid rules of conformity. About authority, it said, policemen, judges, government officials, and respected institutions shall never be presented in such a way as to create disrespect for established authority. About parents, it said, respect for parents, the moral code, and for honorable behavior shall be fostered. About ghoulish activity, it said, scenes dealing with walking dead, vampires, and werewolfism are prohibited. Many comic book publishers closed down. Many writers, artists, and werewolves fled the industry. No respectable person uh, wanted to be involved in that film. There are many, many, many stories of the comic book artists ending up in the uh, alleys and basements of churches and ending up alcoholic. And they did this right at the time when rock and roll was starting to break. That rebellious side of youth culture was becoming more pronounced in other media. And the comic book industry gave up that edge. They lost it. And in some ways, they never quite recovered from that. Between 1954 and 1956, comic book sales fell more than 50%. The industry would never again have the number of readers it had just before Dr. Wortham and the Senate hearings. The Comics Code placated enough of the public to save the industry. But what about the superheroes? Would they survive? They were a dirty little secret that you read under the covers of your bed. Uh, they were the kind of thing that if your parents caught you reading them, you might get in trouble. Comic Book Superheroes Unmasked, brought to you in part by Acura and by Verizon Wireless. Behind them, a little too much fog. Ahead of
of them. A few too many people. But right now, life is perfect. Thanks to purple mountains, fruited plains, and the majestic power of an Acura TL. From city to city, state to state, and coast to coast, Verizon Wireless is helping to bring families closer together with unlimited night and weekend minutes. It's all part of the America's Choice National Family Share Plan, giving your family unlimited night and weekend minutes to share on up to four separate lines so they can say whatever, whenever, wherever. And now, save big on select LG phones. Verizon Wireless, we never stop working for you. Come rain or shine. Can you hear me now? Good. When I go into the schools, I'm very proud of what I do. I help kids learn to read. We did a walkathon for juvenile diabetes. I help feed the homeless in a soup kitchen every Saturday. That's one of my good works. It's giving, it's helping, it's doing, it's giving back to the community. I love to see their faces just light up. Just knowing that you've helped that one person. That they come home and I have a smile on my face. That's my day. I'm very proud to be a Walmart associate. We live here too, and we believe good works. When a madman threatens the world, the greatest adventurer who ever lived must summon the most extraordinary heroes. And the game is on. <laughs> Sean Connery. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. This film is not yet great at July 11th. A no-brainer. What's a no-brainer? Everyone knows what a no-brainer is. You don't have to think about it. It's just that good. Now you can call anyone in America for three cents a minute and 39 cents to connect. And that three cents gets you Canada and Western Europe, too. Just dial 1010987. -10 Nothing to commit to. Just use it when you need it. Hey. What's to think about? 10-10-9-8-7. Ten, ten, the rate this low never went so far. TV. This morning, I turned on the telly, and all I can say is, Jumping Jehoshaphat, yeehaw! Thank you, DirecTV, for all the local channels. Thank you again, sincerely, Al Glover. And cut. How was that? Was that too over the top? No, it was perfect. An actual letter. Someone wrote this. Become a DirecTV fan for just $39.99 a month. Thank you! Good night! It was a bastion of torture and slow death that has been called the most terrifying prison in the world, Devil's Island on Hardcore History, tonight at 11 on the History Channel. 1961. The Eisenhower era was over. The new frontier was beginning. We were going to the moon. We were already in Vietnam. The comic books were still trying to recover from the impact of a government crackdown on the industry. Except for Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, most of DC's superheroes had been canceled by 1951. By the mid-50s, there were millions of kids who were unfamiliar with comic books. By the late 50s, television was the, the medium of choice now for kids. Uh, the comics code had basically killed all the horror and, and crime comics, so they lost that edgy quality. So comic books went back to what they, what had been their strength in the beginning, which was the superhero. In 1956, editor Julius Schwartz oversaw the creation of The Flash, a sleek modern version of the fastest hero of the 40s. DC had found new success with science fiction updates of old characters. Green Lantern, Hawkman, and the Atom. Meanwhile, on a golf course in New York, comic book history was about to change forever. My publisher, Martin Goodman, played golf with the publisher of DC Comics. At least the legend is the publisher of DC Comics uh, said, you know, we've 
actually had some luck with these superheroes. When the new and old heroes joined forces as the Justice League of America, the series provided DC with a new successful title. While DC was on a roll, this was not the case at Martin Goodman's company, where writers and artists were churning out little morality tales featuring giant monsters, and they were tired of it. I would make up a name like Gru or Mongor or anything that was a sound, and Jack would make a story out of it any way he wanted, and I'd put in the, the insipid copy. Then Martin Goodman came back from his golf game with tales of the Justice League sales. Stan, I want you to make up a group of heroes because I think that's what's selling today. Stan asked his wife Joan for advice. She said, well, why don't you just once do a book the way you would like to do it instead of the way they want you to do it? She's like, well, you're going to quit anyway. Just do it. Stanley took the problem to his uh, sometime collaborator, Jack Kirby, and uh, they came up with the Fantastic Four. Inspired by the space race between America and Russia, four people who don't always get along try to beat the commies to the moon. Their rocket is bombarded by cosmic rays. The quartet crash land, and they've acquired superpowers. They team up, but they still don't always get along. Mr. Fantastic would over-explain everything the way I tend to do. The thing would say, will you shut up? We got it already. And, and he and the torch were always arguing and fighting. The thing hated being the thing. And the idea of superheroes hating being a superhero was really a novelty. And it produced a lot of psychological richness, at least comparatively speaking, uh, that had not been seen in comic books before. And so it was with the creation of the Fantastic Four that uh, comic books really uh, entered into the modern era. Lee convinced Goodman to rename his company Marvel after Goodman's very first comic book, which had featured the original Human Torch and the Submariner. Lee and Kirby had already created a new Human Torch, and in early 1962, they revived the Submariner. Lee gave Prince Namor a more noble speaking style and a new reason to hate mankind. He blamed atomic tests for wiping out his undersea capital. Also in 1962, Lee and Kirby unleashed another atomic-aged anti-hero, the Incredible Hulk. Of course, in those days, there were so many movies with nuclear blasts creating monsters and giant things and so forth. So they said there was a gamma ray explosion and he got caught in it and it transformed him. The Hulk was a metaphor for the early 60s fear that atomic weapons would get out of hand. While saving a teenager who's trespassed onto a gamma bomb test site, the bomb's inventor, Dr. Bruce Banner, becomes a victim of his own device. It was Banner's dark side, just sort of, you know, metamorphosizing into flesh and blood, green flesh and blood, of course, but there it was. Whenever Dr. Banner changed, the army he worked for tried to kill him. Even while the Vietnam War was going on, the Hulk's most persistent adversary was the U.S. Army. The Comics Code said that, you know, you couldn't show the Army as villains. And yet, at the same time, Marvel was basically making them to be the bad guys. Uh, they were able to do this simply by saying the Army is trying to do what it thinks is best. It just happens to be a, a little misinformed in this case. The Hulk looked like a menace. He looked like a monster. There was nobody else who understood him except the teenager whose life he saved, Griff Jones. The teenager understands, but the world doesn't understand. Characters like the Hulk struck a chord with a new generation of readers who were growing up questioning authority. There's this character that when he loses his cool, he becomes this green monster, and he goes on tirades, and he just starts smashing things up. Uh, what better metaphor you know, could you have for angry youth? We started to get fan mail. And the postmarks suddenly weren't from kindergartens, but they were from high schools, and then later from colleges. If more readers were teenagers, Lee figured they might like a teenage hero. Lee's boss wasn't so sure. You say that he's a teenager? A hero can only be an adult. Teenagers are sidekicks. And you say you want him to have problems. Stan, don't you know what a hero is? It's interesting that in the 1930s, uh, you had the country seemingly falling apart. And yet you had these superheroes come in that were totally confident in their ability to resolve these problems. 
And then in the Kennedy years, the early 60s, things seemed to be fairly stable. And yet you had the Marvel superheroes come in who were vulnerable and, and confused and disoriented. The difference was the baby boomers. They were notoriously self-absorbed. <laughs> All this was magnified in, in popular culture geared towards youth. James Dean, for example, you know, he may look tough on the outside, but his heart is breaking and he wants to be accepted and he's unsure and his parents don't understand him and the world doesn't understand him. Peter Parker is a shy science major who lives with his Uncle Ben and Aunt May. When a bite from a radioactive spider gives Peter spider-like powers, he doesn't even consider fighting crime. He goes into show business. But when he fails to stop a thief who later murders his uncle, Peter Parker learns that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. People ask me where I came up with the line, with great power must also come great responsibility. And I have no idea. Marvel Comics publisher Martin Goodman had so little faith in the idea, Spider-Man's first appearance in the summer of 1962 was in the last issue of a failed science fiction magazine. Then Goodman saw the sales figures. He said, you know, Stan, you remember that Spider-Man character of yours that we both liked so much? Why don't we do a series about it? Spider-Man went on to become Marvel's greatest success. Part of it was the art by Steve Ditko, who worked on Spider-Man till 1966. After a while, he would give me the artwork for a 20-page story. I didn't know what it was. And I would put the dialogue balloons in because Steve told a story so beautifully that it almost, you almost didn't need the dialogue. Part of the appeal is that before the spider bite, Peter Parker's life was a mess. After he gets superpowers, his life is an even bigger mess. Every teenage reader could identify with that. It's not about that red and blue suit. It's about Peter Parker, the sick aunt, the girl problems, the school problems, uh, you know, the work problem. It's not just a suit jumping off the building. There's somebody inside of that suit that you care about. DC heroes like Superman and Batman acted like the reader's parents. Marvel heroes often acted like the readers. To some extent, this was true even back in the 40s. At that time, the worldview presented in DC comic books was a much simpler, easier to understand kind of worldview. Superman was good, Lex Luthor was evil. As I got older and, you know, more sophisticated, uh, 10, 11, uh, then I started to look for greater degrees of ambiguity in my characters, and that meant that it was time to graduate to Marvel Comics. DC was the old establishment company. Um, Marvel was the upstart that led people to believe there was a rivalry, and there became a rivalry when, when Marvel started out selling DC, and it became very real in terms of, you know, good old bottom line. One of Marvel's boldest moves came in 1964 when Stan Lee and artist Jack Kirby brought back Captain America, timely's World War II hero, whom Kirby had co-created. Readers were told that Captain America had been frozen in ice for 20 years, and shockingly, his kid sidekick, Bucky, had been killed in action. The infallible one-dimensional hero of World War II blamed himself for his partner's death. And in between fights, Captain America brooded like a star-spangled Hamlet. He felt he didn't belong to our age. He, he was, as I say, an anachronism. He, he belonged back in the 40s. Jack hadn't done him that way. And I felt a little bit diffident mentioning it to him, but oh man, Jack loved the idea instantly. Captain America's growing discomfort seemed to mirror the nation's as the certainties of yesterday got turned upside down in a new age of rebellion. We look at what Stan did back in the 60s and we may say, oh wow, I remember those stories really fondly and they, they kind of read kind of quaint and kind of simplistic, you know, they, and maybe they were appealing to kids. Well, no. Back in the 60s, they didn't read that way. They were cutting edge. There was almost counterculture at the time. There was a survey conducted by Esquire magazine in 1965, which revealed that self-described college radicals uh, ranked Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk uh, among their favorite revolutionary icons, right there with Bob Dylan and Che Guevara and Malcolm X. There was a time in the 60s where comics were seen as very smart in the colleges of America, and Stan had his finger right on that pulse. By 1968, Marvel was selling 55 million issues a year, matching or surpassing DC. 
and storytelling got positively psychedelic when a former magician and escape artist named Jim Steranko took over the spy strip, Nick Fury, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. I brought surrealism to comics. I brought expressionism to comics. I brought pop art and op art, optical effects, into comics. Steranko probably had more effect on the comic industry with fewer comics than anyone in history. There was this whole cult of personality created around Starenko, you know. You didn't even hear his first name, it was just Starenko. And he was very aloof and, you know, the, the pictures you saw of him were grainy and blurry and, you know, it was just, just this whole mystique around Starenko. Starenko was the first rock star artist in comics. Like a rock star, he pushed the boundaries of what the comics code found acceptable in the late 60s. They used to take the cleavage line out of my girls. Some changes were truly bizarre. In one silent sequence between Fury and his lady friend, a fully clothed embrace was deleted and replaced with a blow up from the first panel of Fury's gun. This huge pistol shoved into the confines of a shoulder holster was much more suggestive than anything I had on that page. But just as Marvel was pushing the boundaries with S.H.I.E.L.D. and black superheroes like the Black Panther, and cosmic philosophers like the Silver Surfer. One of the oldest superheroes got a new lease on life. In 1966, DC's Batman came to television. The show was a campy take on the caped crusader and soon Batmania swept the nation. Even the Batman comic books, which had been losing readers after years of mediocre stories, doubled in circulation, selling almost 900,000 copies a month. On the one hand, it sparked a huge upsurge in the popularity of superheroes. On the other hand, the resurgence in interest in comic books had been based largely on taking these characters seriously. You talk to people even today, I mean, bring up the topic of superheroes, and they'd say, oh, you know, Biff, Bam, Pow, and, and Ridiculous. The joke soon wore thin. By 1969, the show was off the air, and Batman's comic sales fell almost 60%. To the general public, superheroes were once more seen as kid stuff, and the country was getting too serious for that. We were teetering between the Vietnam anti-war rebellion and the Watergate years. The whole social structure was beginning to open to criticism for the first time. Check out what's coming up tomorrow night on Tech Tuesday, here on the History Channel. All I want is a room somewhere, a nice hello, not a questionnaire, and a great breakfast on the house, local calls, no charge, thank you, and someone who calls me by name and says, Hey, Mr. Jensen, you missed a button there. At Hampton Inn, you got it, Mr. Jensen. From folks who'll do everything to make you feel refreshed, completely loverly, utterly satisfied. We love having you here. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely? My sister convinced me to try it, and now I use it all the time. People are calling all across America for an incredibly low rate of three cents a minute and 39 cents to connect with 1010-987. All I do is dial 1010-987, then 1, and my grandmother's number. It's three cents to Canada and Western Europe, too. I don't have to switch phone companies to use it. Try 1010-987 today. At three cents a minute, it's a no-brainer. Behind them, a little too much fog. Ahead of them, few too many people. But right now, life is perfect. Thanks to purple mountains, fruited plains, and the majestic power of an Acura TL. I'll never forget the look on my mother's face the day I was born. Her hair was a mess. But then, when she took me in her arms, she just looked so beautiful. Wow. Once in a lifetime memories only happen once in a lifetime. Save yours with a Philips DVD recorder and save them for life. The Philips DVD recorder. Remember more. Get to it.
admit it's getting better, a little better. Sure, I have diabetes, but I also have a better way of managing it. I found out that Medicare covers the cost of my diabetes testing supplies, and I don't even use insulin. I just called up Liberty Medical to see if I qualified, and they took it from there. Liberty works with Medicare and my insurance company, so I don't have to. They handle my paperwork, and I don't pay anything up front. Liberty gives me a call when it's time to reorder, so I don't have to bother with that either. I like having less to worry about. My supplies are sent to me at home, and Liberty covers the shipping costs, too. Listen, if Liberty could make things easier for me, they might help you, too. If you have diabetes and you're on Medicare, call Liberty to find out if you qualify at 1-800-574-4159. That's 1-800-574-4159. Call today. You're watching the History Channel. It was a bastion of torture and slow death that has been called the most terrifying prison in the world, Devil's Island on Hardcore History, tonight at 11 on the History Channel. The superhero revival of the 50s was colliding with the counterculture. To hold on to their readers, especially their college-age readers, superheroes would have to get with it. DC wanted to update Wonder Woman for 1968. Writer and artist Mike Sikowski started the process, and later journalist turned comic writer Denny O'Neill was brought in to continue Wonder Woman's transformation to 60s hip. It wasn't easy, as O'Neill found out. When you get a job like that, implicit in it is shake it up, do something new. DC took away Wonder Woman's costume and powers and had her learn karate. It was hoped that a more realistic Wonder Woman would be embraced by the new woman's lib movement. But feminist leaders like Gloria Steinem, who'd grown up with the original version, hated the changes. They said that I had taken the only powerful woman in comics and had taken her power away from her. It is now many years later and I absolutely see what they were talking about. After four years of karate kicks, DC agreed with Gloria Steinem and gave Wonder Woman back her powers and her costume. So, uh, and not one of the more glorious chapters in my comic book career. O'Neill had better luck with another legend whose sales were slipping, Batman. DC editor Julius Schwartz wanted to erase the stain of the campy TV show and get back to the 1939 roots of the character. As a loner who never showed his face in the light, it was the way I remembered those early Bill Finger, Bob Kane stories. Schwartz teamed O'Neill with artist Neil Adams, who brought a dynamic new realism to superheroes. Neil once said, if superheroes existed, they would have to look the way I draw them. And I think that's absolutely right. The Batman of the late 60s and early 70s was a fearsome creature of the night for the first time in 30 years. O'Neill and Adams had saved the character from the clutches of camp. But their next resurrection job would involve more than stylistic change. O'Neill and Adams were about to bring social commentary to comics in a radical new way. DC editor Julius Schwartz thought putting more messages in the adventures of Green Lantern might save the book from cancellation. So let's try it. Let's see if we can start using as a springboard what's happening in the newspapers. Green Lantern was a hero with a lot of power but no personality. A test pilot inducted in a cosmic police force. He used his power ring to fight supervillains and creatures from outer space. I had thought of Green Lantern as an enforcer of the status quo. So we needed a contrast with that. Green Arrow is a character dating back to the 40s, never had his own title, had appeared in, in anthology books, and was kind of a Batman with a bow and arrow. But he was really bland, so we made him the voice of the streets, the voice of the left. In early 1970, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, number 76, hit newsstands like a Molotov cocktail. 
it was openly liberal, even radical. Green Arrow tells readers that a moral cancer is rotting America's soul. The well-meaning Green Lantern is accused of being a racist. What I remember putting in the script was asking Neil to draw the best face he had ever drawn of a black guy who had been through hell. And he did it. And he starts to say something about, well, I hear you've been helping the blue skins and the green skins on these other planets. You've done a lot for the purple skins. What have you done for the black skins? It's one of the most reprinted panels in comics history. When you look back at it, well, what's so radical about this? But at the time, it was an outrageous proposition. My theory was that it was probably too late for my generation. But maybe you get a real smart 12-year-old and get him thinking about racism. Green Lantern, Green Arrow was self-consciously relevant. It tackled religion, race, pollution, and Native American rights. But there were some things that even relevant comics steered clear of. One, incredibly, was the major news story of the time, Vietnam. In the early 60s, some characters were featured in Vietnam-themed storylines. But when the war and the protests at home were raging in the late 60s and early 70s, Vietnam was generally avoided. I think that generally there was a feeling that that was a, a scary topic. Letters uh, would come in from fans saying, you know, hey, how come Captain America doesn't go to Vietnam like you, you know, and, and fight the commies there and, like he did uh, the Nazis in World War II? Marvel heroes had fought the commies in the early 60s. But by the end of the decade, Cold War attitudes didn't seem relevant. After a while, I think we weren't that sure that the communists were the greatest evil in the world. I tried to avoid stories about the war. The Vietnam War, to me, was too tragic a thing. By the time we got the courage to do material about Vietnam, I think the war was pretty much over. The other untouched issue of the period was drugs. Until, ironically, the Nixon administration forced the issue in 1971. I had received a letter from the government, from the um, Office of Health, Education, and Welfare. They thought it would really be beneficial if I would get a story about the dangers of drug addiction and featured in one of our top books. Lee and artist Gil Kane and John Romita worked out a three-issue story arc in which Spider-Man fought the Green Goblin. In a subplot, Spider-Man saves an inner-city kid so stoned he thinks he can fly. I know nothing about drugs, so I didn't mention what he overdosed on. I didn't know. Later, Spider-Man's friend Harry, the Green Goblin's son, gets hooked on pills and suffers a near-fatal overdose. The reader didn't feel we were giving him a lecture. It was just an incident in a story, which I feel is the best way to do it. Only one problem. The Comics Code Authority didn't want Lee to do it at all. Rejected. We could not put the seal of approval on those issues. I said, why? They said, according to the code, you're not allowed to mention drugs. I said, but we're not telling the kids to take drugs. The whole purpose of this is to show the danger of drug addiction. Doesn't matter, you're not allowed to mention drugs. At an impasse, Lee turned to his publisher, Martin Goodman, for support. And Martin, I want to do these books anyway, so we won't have the seal of approval. I was so proud of him. He backed me to the hilt. He said, absolutely, Stan, just let's send him out. For three months, Marvel published Spider-Man without the code's approval. The world didn't end. The sky didn't fall. We had the greatest write-ups. My father came home and he said, you know, you have to go pick up this thing called Spider-Man. I'm like, why? Of course, what he didn't realize at the time was that he started a whole new addiction, uh, which was comic books. So, uh, you know, coincidentally, I never used drugs, but boy, I collected comic books like crazy. Thanks to the controversy, the comics code was liberalized. A few months later, when DC published a much stronger drug story, with Green Arrow's former kid sidekick Speedy as an out-and-out -out heroin addict, it not only got the seal of approval, but New York Mayor John Lindsay wrote a letter of commendation. But good intentions didn't translate into sales. 
two issues later, Green Lantern Green Arrow was canceled. Relevancy had run its course. But when it came to the first superhero, his durability was proven once again. Over the years, many different writers and artists had redefined Superman. The character had survived because he could be reinterpreted to reflect the times. The 1978 motion picture starring Christopher Reeve kept the basics of the legend and added a late 70s edge of sex and romance. First Superman is, is wonderful. It's a really great origin story. If you like the comics, I think part two appeals to you even more because, you know, he's fighting superpowered villains. Three years before Superman the movie hit theaters, the project would prove to be a milestone for Superman's creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. In the 1940s, they had sued DC over royalties and the rights to Superman and lost. Now, artist Neil Adams took up their cause. Using the publicity surrounding the upcoming movie, he pressured DC to make amends. In 1975, Siegel and Schuster got a modest lifetime pension and a restored byline on Superman. But DC kept the rights. The first two Superman movies were huge box office successes, and Superman's value as a licensed product was reconfirmed. But he was no longer the most popular hero in comic books. Readers' tastes were once again changing, or perhaps mutating. The new hot heroes, the X-Men, didn't always deal with specific political issues. But they were relevant in a broader sense. The X-Men are very relevant because above and beyond everything else, it's a story of bigotry, of these people who are hated because they're different, even though they're good. And they're trying to help the world. I mean, there's almost a little bit of a Jesus Christ feeling in there. The X-Men are sort of the most consciously, deliberately, and successfully metaphorical of any comic book superhero. The X-Men are a team of teenage mutants, each born with a superpower that manifests around puberty. More mutants are starting to get born, the, the fear grows even more amongst normal human beings that they will take over the Earth. Growing up in Israel, I understood the metaphor. It was about the right to live and the right to exist. If you're African-American growing up reading comic books, you could relate to the X-Men. If you were gay growing up reading comic books, you could relate to the X-Men. If you were merely just a geek, a nerd being picked on, you could relate to the X-Men. The idea of being simultaneously special and persecuted is a very potent, powerful one. The X-Men were created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby in 1963, but never really took off until the late 70s, with stories by Chris Claremont, art by Dave Cockrum and John Byrne, and new mutants like Storm, and especially Wolverine. He's got that whole bad boy thing going on. It's James Dean, sort of Clint Eastwood kind of attitude to him. Wolverine was the kind of character you could not have had in the 1960s, uh, because he was very much a reflection of that cynicism and sense of irony that came out of the 60s, uh, that came out of Vietnam and Watergate. Wolverine was a superhero for Generation X. He wasn't afraid to take it to the bad guys exactly the way they would take it to you, or worse. I know as kids, we were always fascinated by Wolverine's adamantium claws, but it was just the idea of having a weapon so handy all the time, never having to reach for it, just, you know, snap. Wolverine, in many ways, was the precursor to a darker hero. In the early 1980s, a new breed of creatures would take rough justice to new levels. It was really up to people of my generation to basically give Batman his balls back. Check out what's coming up tomorrow night on Tech Tuesday, here on the History Channel. When it comes to athlete's foot, this is the latest. This isn't. Lotrimin Ultra, the latest prescription strength medicine available without a prescription. The latest cure, so ultra powerful, one use a day is all you need. Nothing's proven stronger or faster. Lotrimin Ultra. Introducing McCormick Grillmates Grilling Sauces. Just grill, brush, and let the feast begin. New Grillmates Grilling Sauces, along with seasonings and marinades, are from McCormick, the taste you trust. This is important. You have to feel the SUV. The power of the SUV is making you become a different person. And go. Now you're in a stream. You're going through a stream. You're going through a naturally occurring bridge. Rugged. Sweet. Going through 11 feet of snow. You're in a cargo plane. Long 
punches you out. You land. Okay, now you're driving over everything. You're going over logs and stuff like that. You're going over things. Mom, Dad, welcome to our new home. Oh, Bill's afraid of termites, so we had the entire home made of concrete. Oh, so modern. Comfortable. Here's a better idea. Call Terminex for a lifetime protection plan that covers repairs on any new termite damage. Don't you want protection this good? 1-800-TERMINEX. No bugs, no hassles. For a mattress, good for the back. Dear DirecTV, Cable says reception quality is poor with satellite TV. Lies! My reception is way better with DirecTV than it ever was with Cable. Sincerely, John Amenta. <laughs> Did I capture the guy's anger? Yeah? Thank you. Become a DirecTV fan for just $39.99 a month. Cut! From city to city, state to state, and coast to coast, Verizon Wireless is helping to bring families closer together with unlimited night and weekend minutes. It's all part of the America's Choice National Family Share Plan, giving your family unlimited night and weekend minutes to share on up to four separate lines so they can say whatever, whenever, wherever. And now, say big on select LG phones. Verizon Wireless, we never stop working for you. Come rain or shine. Can you hear me now? Good. Looking for really tough virus protection? Switch to MSN8. Sign up now and get virus protection that automatically scans your email, plus two months free. It's better with the butterfly. Go to msn8.com today. When you want a battery that keeps going, and going, and going, and going, Energizer Max. Do you have the bunny inside? You taking that for heartburn? Panel of experts recommend it. More doctors recommend Tums. Dose for dose, Tums Ultra neutralizes more acid than Pepsi completes antacid. Nothing's faster. Just ask a real panel of experts. It was a bastion of torture and slow death that has been called the most terrifying prison in the world. Devil's Island on Hardcore History. Tonight at 11 on the History Channel. In the closing years of the Cold War, inflation was high. The potential for global destruction was ever-present. And the comic book industry was trying to find its place in the world. I think all those things balance together to a questioning of which way is the world going? And that reflected itself in the superheroes. We couldn't accept a goody-goody coming down and doing things just because they were good. But we could accept somebody who felt some twisted emotional need to fight evil. Uh, and we could accept it with violence, and we could accept it with irony which is what writer-artist Frank Miller wanted to give readers. My mother says that I was somewhere around six years old when I walked into the kitchen and, and, and held up a, a, a bunch of sheets of typing paper I'd folded in half and stapled in the middle and said, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Miller got his big break in 1979, when, at the age of 22, he took over one of Marvel's second-string titles, Daredevil. I was very hungry to do it because it was my chance to do a crime comic, just having to be in red tights. Daredevil was a Stan Lee, Bill Everett creation from the 1960s. By day, Matt Murdock is a New York defense attorney. By night, he's a vigilante with unique powers and problems. The dude's blind, but he's all his other senses are heightened. So right then and there, you're like, this is one of the most implausible comic book characters on the planet. Blind guy flipping off roofs and whatnot, dressed like he's dressed. But Miller brought this really wonderful humanity to it, and the humanity came from this place of, of Daredevil being so flawed, just being kind of broken. I figured Daredevil had to be a Catholic, because only a Catholic could be a vigilante and an attorney at the same time. Miller turned Daredevil's sweet blonde girlfriend into a drug addict. And created a new love interest for Daredevil, Elektra, Matt Murdock's college girlfriend, now an assassin for hire. And I stole one of Will Eisner's best spirit stories um, of a character called Saren Seraph. 
uh, stole it structurally top to bottom. You know, it's, I make no excuses. He knows it, <laughs> and I told him. I was always slightly in contempt of the nice girl next door who your mother was always introducing you to. <laughs> it was a slut down the street that was really interesting. <laughs> When Miller killed Elektra after 14 issues, fans were shocked, but admired the artistic guts it took to kill such a popular character. Later, Marvel brought her back to life. Some characters are just too good or too good looking to stay dead. Miller challenged the traditional superhero notion of non-lethal justice when he revived a 1970s vigilante called The Punisher. After the Mafia guns down his family, ex-Marine Frank Castle wages a one-man war against crime and actually kills people. This was a little too strong for the 70s, but fit the 80s like a 44 bullet in a magnum chamber. To Daredevil, the Punisher was a villain, but readers loved him, and a host of writers and artists tried to meet the man. People voted for Reagan because he kicked butt, because he came on as a tough guy. And I think that attitude was mirrored in superheroes of the 80s. It's not to say the people who wrote The Punisher believed that, but I think they did tap into a popular mood. Then came the British. Same edge, different slant. More European, more political. Writer Alan Moore and artist Dave Gibbons created a 12-issue miniseries for DC in 1985 called The Watchmen. Alan Moore said he was really out to kind of destroy the whole notion of not just superheroes but heroes in general because these are people that you trust with your lives and nobody should do that. Uh, you really needed to trust yourself. In the alternate universe of The Watchmen, superheroes are morally ambivalent, impotent, or psychotic. One of them ends the Cold War by faking an alien invasion that unites the world and kills three million New Yorkers in the process. Alan created this story commenting on superheroes, talking about superheroes, what they meant, and also talking about how it felt to be out on the streets in 1985 with Russia versus America, feeling like the nuclear clock was clicking closer and closer. Watchmen was the most complex and intricate superhero story ever produced. It inspired a generation of artists and writers. Most of the guys in comics lived within about 50 miles of here. So we were all at the same poker games and the same parties. And it's just, wow, how the hell did he do that? And you went home and you ripped up whatever you had done that week and just said, no, damn it, there's, there's more I can do. Even Frank Miller felt he could do more. His next project, a four-issue fantasy of the future, The Dark Knight Returns. It pits an aging Batman against psychotic foes and a corrupt society. I just wanted to do this older Batman and, and to make him really nasty. I thought, what better way to make him a badass than have him be the dirty Harry out there, the, the, the guy that nobody likes. For Miller's Batman, the biggest problem isn't the Joker, but Superman. A well-meaning Boy Scout in thrall to Ronald Reagan, conducting one man's secret wars in Central America. Superman and Batman had been friends since 1940, but weren't after 1986. I'll gleefully take credit for breaking up the Batman-Superman friendship. Bruce has been one who enforces order upon the world and believes that entropy is the natural state of existence. Whereas Superman believes that order is the norm. These two people would not like each other. They just wouldn't. We felt at the time like every Batman story that could have been told had already been told. And suddenly, here's Frank. In the mainstream media, it, it got a great deal of attention, positive and negative, mostly positive. Within the comics industry, it, it seemed to be closest thing to a bar fight anybody could have asked for and that, and that, and that it was quite controversial that, that, that I actually got called up by former Batman writers saying I had ruined their character. Dark Knight has been accused of being a pro-fascist vision. I mean, it doesn't make it any less interesting um, as a work of art, nor does it say particularly that that's the side that Frank comes down on. I think my stuff's kind of jolly, but that's just me. 
The Watchmen and Batman The Dark Knight Returns. There were two watershed books uh, of that period. I think it was a good thing and a bad thing. I think that even though those works are both brilliant works, the traditional innocence of superheroes went out of the market at that point. In the grim and gritty era, old characters were given new problems. Child abuse, a daring new topic in the 1980s, was revealed as the cause of the Hulk's anger. His father had beat him and his mother. Other heroes developed severe drinking problems. One of the biggest changes of all happened to Superman's arch enemy. For 45 years, Lex Luthor had been a mad scientist. That had no longer been grim and gritty enough. So he was transformed into the most evil thing on earth, a 1980s businessman. Lex Luthor's transformation reflected another concern about Reagan's America, which is the real source of evil was once again, like in the 1930s, corporate America. But maybe comics' darkest moment came when DC decided to kill Robin. Not the original boy wanted Dick Grayson. He'd been allowed to grow up, go to college, and become a character called Nightwing. This was a new Robin named Jason Todd, a replacement sidekick whom many people hated. You hear the, about characters taking on a life of their own. Jason was the best example of that I've ever personally encountered. Nobody set out to make him an obnoxious little snot, but he kind of was that. In 1988, Batman's crazed white-faced foe, the Joker, captured Jason, beat him to a pulp, and set off an explosion. DC left his fate up to the readers. If they dialed one 900 number, he survived the explosion. If they dialed the other, the kid didn't make it. And we waited. DC received 10,614 calls. The verdict, death, by 72 votes. When the mainstream press got wind of this, they were outraged. I think most people thought it was Dick Grayson. People had an emotional investment in Robin, even if they hadn't seen a comic book in 20 years. I used to have a little Batman symbol on my jacket lapel. I went into a, a Fifth Avenue deli to buy a tuna fish sandwich, and the guy looked at that and asked who I was, and I, I said, I edit Batman. He said, hey, this is the guy that killed Robin! Batman later found a third Robin, a nice kid named Tim Drake whom fans did accept. But the death of Jason Todd continues to haunt Batman and Denny O'Neill. I thought I was a guy writing and editing fiction. I realized that, no, uh, the Batman editor and the Superman editor are more than that. We are the custodians of folklore. The 1980s ended with the release of Tim Burton's movie, Batman. The film seemed to signal a new era for superheroes. But just ahead, they would be big trouble. The sad, horrible, pitiable collector's bubble, um, which came very close, I think, to wiping out comics for a second time. Check out what's coming up tomorrow night on Tech Tuesday, here on the History Channel. Introducing McCormick Grillmates Grilling Sauces. Just grill, brush, and let the feast begin. New Grillmates Grilling Sauces, along with seasonings and marinades, are from McCormick, the taste you trust. Why do we work? Why do we get up every day and leave the people we love? At the Principal Financial Group, we know you work for more than just a paycheck. For 120 years, the principal has helped people keep more of the money they make and do more with the money they save. You work hard. We make work work hard for you. The Principal Financial Group. We understand what you're working for. Dear DirecTV, there's not a word to describe how great DirecTV is. It's not great. It's not greater than great. It's even greater than greatest. My mom. I first didn't know if it was a good idea, but now she loves DirecTV, and it saves her money. Signed, Brian Mills. <laughs> Brian, I think I'm gonna have you write my next review. Become a DirecTV fan for just $39.99 a month.
You want the best values in America? Well, they're here now at the Dodge Summer Sales Drive. Where you'll find our best products. Like Dodge Caravan, with over 32 standard features and available bucket seats. And our best deals, get up to a $3,500 cash allowance or 0% APR financing for 60 months on Caravan. All with Dodge's 7-year, 70,000-mile powertrain limited warranty. Let us prove we got the best values in America. Hurry to your Dodge dealer today. From city to city, state to state, and coast to coast, Verizon Wireless is helping to bring families closer together with unlimited night and weekend minutes. It's all part of the America's Choice National Family Share Plan, giving your family unlimited night and weekend minutes to share on up to four separate lines so they can say whatever, whenever, wherever. And now, save big on select LG phones. Verizon Wireless, we never stop working for you. Come rain or shine. Can you hear me now? Good. A no-brainer. What's a no-brainer? Everyone knows what a no-brainer is. You don't have to think about it. It's just that good. Now you can call anyone in America for three cents a minute and 39 cents to connect. And that three cents gets you Canada and Western Europe, too. Just dial 1010987. -10 Nothing to commit to. Just use it when you need it. Hey, what's to think about? 1010987. The rate this low never went so far. Hey, fish stick, your SUV's pretty tough, right? Not when friction takes over, pal. Friction and heat cause stress and wear, which over time can make that little dinghy seem a lot heavier. Nice shooting, Tex. You need Quaker State for 4x4s, SUVs, and trucks. It's proven to reduce friction and deliver superior performance under high stress and heat. One word, pal, carpool. Quaker State, the power to reduce friction. Don't make me send you the lab results. For the first time on DVD, the History Channel presents The Century of Warfare. This epic seven DVD set can be yours for only $139.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-708-1776 or visit HistoryChannel.com. By the late 1970s, the average comic book cost 40 cents. This was too much for some young readers, but not enough for most newsstand dealers. Comic book publishers needed a new outlet for their product. They found it in the growing number of stores that were selling old comic books as collector's items. If we've got these comic shops selling used comics and back issues, we should be able to get them the new comics. That would be cool. The superheroes moved off the newsstands and into several thousand stores scattered across the country. These stores became like private clubs, catering to a hardcore base of comic book fans. The den-like atmosphere of, of most comic book stores is, is straight out of comics. It's very Batcave-like. It's a kind of self-defense mechanism. We walk into a comic book store and it's kind of dark and dingy because they don't want outsiders coming in and being like, what's this? This is silly. The comic book changed from being a mass market product to a specialty item, sold at higher prices and marketed to older readers. There's still a small group of people who react to say, but comics are for children. We point out with some passion and energy that comics not only aren't only for kids, they're not mostly for kids today. One of the most successful and critically praised mature series was Sandman from DC's new Vertigo imprint. It was written by Neil Gaiman, who'd grown up in England with reprints of American comics. Reading comics for me, it was like getting postcards from Oz. DC's first Sandman in 1939 fought crooks with a gas mask and a gas gun, then with tights and a sidekick. A second Sandman in 1974 was a superhero master of dreams. Gaiman used bits of both in Morpheus, the godlike lord of the dreaming, a very different superhero. The idea of putting somebody in a costume seemed very odd. I thought, I don't know any people who wear costumes. On the other hand, you know, having somebody who dressed all in black well, seemed kind of obvious to me. Whatever was going through my head, month to month, it went straight into Sandman. I could do anything from stories set in Roman times all the way to the Iraq war and the ruins of Baghdad. Sandman No. 19, based on Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, was the first comic to win a World Fantasy Award. Not in a special comic book category, but as best short story. Previous awards had gone to noted authors like Harlan Ellison 
and Jorge Luis Borges. Some on the committee felt that a comic book didn't belong in such company. We got the award on the Saturday night. On the Sunday morning, um, they changed the rules to make sure it could never happen again. It was more than closing the stable door after the horse had gone. It was more like closing the stable door after the horse had gotten out and won the Kentucky Derby. At least Gaiman still got respect at D.C., where he had complete creative freedom. Almost. When I wrote the Serial Killers Convention episode of Sandman, I had a reference in it to masturbation. And a message came down, people do not masturbate in the DC universe. Over the next decade, comics like movies and TV would experience a sexual revolution. In the 1990s, uh, comic books began to take on issues, uh, explore issues that they never would have come close to before, like homosexuality. Gay and lesbian characters would proliferate. In The Authority, Apollo and Midnighter are violent crime fighters and tender lovers. In the early 1990s, comics were making a lot of money, and not only for publishers. Unlike their predecessors, writers and artists could now own the characters they created. And if a new superhero hit big, its creator could make a lot of money, like Todd McFarlane. McFarlane had made his name as an artist and writer on Spider-Man. In 1992, he and a few other popular artists formed Image, a creator-owned company that challenged the big two of Marvel and DC with comics like Spawn. When Al Simmons, an African-American assassin for the US government, is murdered, he comes back as a hell spawn with superpowers from the devil. He battles heaven, hell, and human evil, all the while trying to get used to the idea that his wife is now his widow and married to his best friend. Spawn number one sold 1.7 million copies and led to an animated series on HBO, a live action movie, and a line of toys. There was a point in the early 90s where comic book creators, writers, artists, publishers were all becoming millionaires. Because comics were now sold in specialty shops, it was easier for publishers to put out one-shot issues that weren't necessarily part of the hero's regular storylines. These were called graphic novels, which sounded more impressive than comic books. Occasionally, the stories were openly political. By the early 1990s, some politicians saw these graphic novels as a way of embracing or promoting controversial issues. A 1993 anti-handgun story from D.C. had politicians rallying around Batman to help raise awareness for stricter gun laws. Batman was a more logical character than Superman because Batman's parents were killed by a gun. Virginia Governor Doug Wilder showed seduction of the gun to state legislators as an example of why a stringent handgun law was needed. The law passed, and the governor invited writer John Ostrander and editor Denny O'Neill to the signing ceremony. A few years later, in 1996, comic books were used to raise awareness about the dangers of unexploded landmines. DC produced a special Superman comic that could be distributed to children in Bosnia. The issue warned children to steer clear of undetonated landmines. We were told by people over there, we met later, that they really feel we saved some lives. Batman also joined the campaign with a special issue Denny O'Neill wrote called Batman, Death of Innocence. Batman is trying to save a little girl whose father has been killed by a landmine. And he gets her almost all the way and then she sees this shiny plastic thing and she picks it up and dies. Batman fails to save this little girl. Some landmine activists had hoped that the Batman graphic novel could be used as ammunition in a campaign to encourage the Senate to sign a treaty banning landmines. But the proposed treaty failed to pass on the Senate floor. Superheroes may have lost occasional battles in national politics, but they were nearly killed by the economic ups and downs of their own industry. At the start of the 90s, Business boomed as investors saw comic books as a haven during the recession. An influx of speculators came in, people who really weren't reading comics, they were just buying them as investments. There were articles in the newspapers that comic books are a better investment than the stock market. 
Stores marked up comics that were only weeks old and sold them for several times their cover prices. Speculators hoped they'd one day be worth as much as the collector's items from the 1940s. And then the greed factor sort of set in with every publisher, where, you know, they started producing alternate covers, special editions. Sales went through the roof and into space. Some books were selling like six million copies when there were only half a million readers. But these half a million readers were all, you know, buying two and three and four editions of this particular book. And because they were buying that many, the publishers were printing more and more and more copies. You had a lot of adults and a lot of little kids who thought they were going to either get rich or put themselves through college on these books. The only reason the old comics were going for a lot of money is they were rare. Nobody pays a lot of money for something that's all over the place. They were a glut on the market. When the fans started to try to sell the books they were saving and found they couldn't sell them, they stopped buying multiple copies. And suddenly the publishers were caught with these huge print runs. We had a crash at the end of it we haven't seen to this day. After 1993, thousands of comic stores closed. Hundreds of creators lost their jobs. By 1996, Marvel filed for bankruptcy. Monthly sales fell from 48 million to 7 million. The medium almost died. It really almost died. To make matters worse, a potential new generation of readers had other distractions. The internet and electronic games. The industry limped through the late 90s with stunts like finally marrying off Superman and Lois Lane and electing the evil Lex Luthor president in 2000. Superheroes spent most of their time in the world of fantasy until the real world intruded one September morning. We used New York as a backdrop for all our books. We had to do something. Comic Book Superheroes Unmasked, brought to you in part by 1010-987 and by the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. My sister convinced me to try it, and now I use it all the time. People are calling all across America for an incredibly low rate of three cents a minute and 39 cents to connect with 1010-987. All I do is dial 1010-987, then one, and my grandmother's number. It's three cents to Canada and Western Europe, too. I don't have to switch phone companies to use it. Try 1010-987 today. At three cents a minute, it's a no-brainer. When a madman threatens the world, the greatest adventurer who ever lived must summon the most extraordinary heroes. And the game is on. Sean Connery. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. This film is not yet great at July 11. You guys find a wedge at oh all? Oh my god. What is this thing? How about we play for a Buick Rainier? You're kidding. Come on. Okay, this is going to be some fun. Go, Beverly, go! Hi! Come on in! Kind of breezy in here. With 80 mile per hour wind, and that spider can grab hold of a perfect. What? No, God! Meet my husband, Stanley! Here's a better idea. Call Terminix. More people trust us to solve their pest problems. 1-800-TERMINIX. No bugs, no hassles. When it comes to athlete's foot, this is the latest. This isn't. Lotrimin Ultra, the latest prescription strength medicine available without a prescription. The latest cure, so ultra powerful. One use a day is all you need. Nothing's proven stronger or faster. Lotrimin Ultra. Introducing McCormick Grillmates Grilling Sauces. Just grill. Brush and let the feast begin. New Grillmates Grilling Sauces, along with seasonings and marinades, are from McCormick, the taste you trust. I like to have fun when I'm online, but my old email just wasn't any fun. Then I signed up for MSN 8. 
got my butterfly. This guy never quits. Now I can email photos with graphics and cool type. Now that's fun. He also lets me browse with my friends. Well, you know, surf the same sites at the same time. It's great. Yep, me and my butterfly. We're what you call social creatures. Looking for a more expressive internet service? Try MSN 8, built with advanced Microsoft software. Go to get.msn.com today and get two free months when you sign up. MSN 8 helps you take email farther with photo editing and custom graphics built right in. You'll also get shared browsing that lets you link up with a friend and see the best of the web together. Plus other features AOL can't match. Switching is easy and hassle-free with powerful switching software that moves your AOL address book, notifies your contacts, and forwards your emails for a month. Go to get.msn.com today and get two free months when you sign up. MSN 8. It's better with the butterfly. It was a bastion of torture and slow death that has been called the most terrifying prison in the world, Devil's Island on Hardcore History, next on The History Channel. You're watching The History Channel. Comic book superheroes had been rebels and vigilantes in the social turmoil of the Great Depression. And then, patriotic soldiers in World War II. They reflected the unrest of Vietnam and Watergate. At the start of the 21st century, most characters were more violent, more cynical, more sexually active than ever before. In other words, they reflected their world, as popular culture always does. Comic books have been around since the dawn of time. They just weren't put on paper, they were put on cave walls. The stories of the great hunt, of, uh, of the great droughts, of the great famine. Superhero comics are just an extension of that. But sometimes, comics have anticipated reality. No one could have imagined September 11th, unless they'd read comic books. Osama bin Laden's plan was to create so much chaos and so much destruction that there would be a general war and, and that Islamic fundamentalist uh, or Islamist movements would take over governments and, and countries, even the United States. And when I heard that, it sounded like a comic book plot. It sounded like something Dr. Doom would do. Uh, we're going to create chaos and take over the world. Unfortunately, the real world looks more like a comic book world than ever before. No longer are, you know, two 110-story buildings falling to the ground, the stuff of fantasy. We felt it in New York when it fell. I felt the ground tremble. As the quintessential New York hero, it seemed only right that Spider-Man would be personally affected by the attacks. This picture of Spider-Man looking at ground zero, it's compelling, it's emotional. He represents all of us. Frank Miller was halfway through his futuristic sequel to Dark Knight Returns when the towers fell. I just, you know, had a flying Batmobile going to a skyscraper and blown up half a metropolis. So it was, it was an awkward moment for me in DC Comics. Because I was drawing th this story while I was breathing in the World Trade Center in, 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 you know, in my Manhattan home. And, I, and I, uh, um, I had to acknowledge it. And the only way I could do it was to have Superman in the wreckage of Metropolis, finding a lock of Flo's lanes and finding out that you know, the love of his life was dead. And, and then move on. <clears throat> Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, and Image put out commemorative comics that raised millions of dollars for the 9-11 victims and their families. Jim Steranko created a fundraising poster that recalled the glory days of World War II, when the superheroes were enthusiastically united against a common enemy. 21st century comic books had none of that. I think it would be too corny and it would be in bad taste to have a cartoon figure punching a, a, a Muslim and saying, we'll get you. It, no, that wouldn't work today, I think. A superhero's job isn't mourning the dead, it's fighting evil. And when your name is Captain America and your country is attacked, you have to do something. And it was the supervillain of the month that Cap would fight. And now the stories of Captain America are much more relevant. He's dealing with terrorism at home, terrorism abroad, um, making them look that much more relevant. And yet Captain America suspects that his own government is hiding information about funneling weapons to terrorists. 
the World War II veteran is also haunted by parallels between 9-11 and the Allied firebombing of Dresden. That kind of political complexity is usually missing in action when superheroes leave the printed page for the mainstream media. Superhero adventures are often simplified on TV, in video games, and in movies. Nevertheless, with comic book sales dropping, those venues may be the superhero's best hope for continued survival in the marketplace. Every major motion picture studio and television network head is looking at comic books to find the next big franchisable hit. But making a good superhero movie is tougher than it looks. You know, I've seen Batman, I've seen Superman, Spider-Man, and I've seen Daredevil. They, those movies are all wonderful on one level or another, but what they're missing is the character's ability to internalize on a, on a page where you can read their thoughts and what's going through their mind. Although they may be difficult to adapt, the fact that comic book characters and storylines are devoured by other media is a sure sign of the revered status comic books hold in pop culture. The funny thing is now, the comic book is much more glamorous than having a newspaper strip. Those of us working in the medium felt that we were working in a medium that was a despised art form, and indeed it was. We're at the cusp of, of acceptance as a valid art form. But the respect comic books are now getting may be coming too late for the superheroes. Comic book superheroes, in some ways, are more popular and more prevalent than they've ever been because of major motion pictures, video games, the internet, and so forth. And in other ways, you know, comic book sales of superheroes are at historic lows. You went from easily being able to sell a million comic books to where the top selling book in this industry to retailers is 150, 160,000. To keep the industry going, Publishers are exploring retail outlets beyond comic book stores. While comic shops are always the core of our business, the fastest growing area is bookstores. The graphic novel and the collections that become graphic novels are uh, really the future. And of course, there's the internet. Over the next 20 years, there will be more and more cartooning delivered online. It'll never be as pleasant to read something on a screen as it is to hold it in your hand, and to turn those pages and turn back. We all love paper, don't get me wrong. But I think that electronic comics are really the way of the future. Will superheroes be part of that future? The ones that work are archetypes, made by people who believed and cared. Batman will still be around in a hundred years' time. <laughs> I see a bright future for tights. Precisely because it's the one genre that was created by comic books. Comic book writers and artists are doing the same thing that storytellers did drawing the pictures on the caves at Lescaux. We're using story to create context for life. On a very, very good day, and we don't have enough of them, that becomes art. On an ordinary day, it becomes escape. It's always magic. Superheroes endure because they represent basic American beliefs. That there are choices to make between good and evil. That individuals can make a difference in society and history. Superheroes have come a long way since their first flight. At times it's been a bumpy ride, but the comics and the characters have been equal to the task. There's something so enduring in what superheroes represent, the choice between good and evil, the power of an individual to make a difference in society and history. To find out more about your favorite superhero, visit your local comic book store. For the History Channel, I'm Peter Wilson. Thanks for watching. The History Channel presents Comic Book Superheroes Unmasked. Get your copy on VHS or DVD-R, plus a special limited edition comic for only $29.95. Call 1-800-708-1776 or visit shophistorychannel.com.
Tomorrow on Tech Tuesday, a radical diesel engine design and advanced sonar, radar, and torpedo data computers made U.S. subs state-of-the-art killing machines and the key to victory in the Pacific. The American submarine campaign during the Second World War reduced the Japanese Navy to near non-existence. Deep Sea Detectives, Silent Service, tomorrow on the History Channel.